Hi everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for joining us in this first uh, fireside chat uh, with a Parallax author. Um, I'm really happy and pleased to present uh, uh, Urena Jackson, the author of Girls Rising, a book that was just released, um, you know, last week, I think. Um, and so Urena is going to talk to us today about her work and also uh, the book itself. Um, and of course. Um, um, this wouldn't be an interactive webinar if, didn't, if there wasn't any kind of interaction. And so you can type in your questions uh, into this Q&A box you see in the top right-hand corner. Um, or you can type in your questions or comments um, in the chat window um, just under the video screen. All right, so um, let's get started. Um, Reno, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Sure. Um, essentially, it's a guide for adults that are working with and mentoring and also parenting girls between the ages of 12 and 17. Um, and it, it, it provides a series of processes or activities, there's approximately 40, um, that are kind of creative catalysts for young people exploring relevant developmental themes. So, for, for instance, they... Um, it presents things on socialization, <clears throat> the process and the power of it, and how socialization um, kind of affects our, our, our sense of identity and also how we interpret reality. Um, it, it kind of covers over the confluence of emotions and our thoughts, as well as emotional integration and management. Um, there's pieces on mindful communication, on empathy, on boundaries on social action or social engagement. Um, and then there's a, an entire piece on really exploring a personal spirituality or rather looking at the world through a sacred lens. So I, I kind of like to think of it as um, an education of the soul. And when I say soul, I mean just the intrinsic nature of, of things. And so it, these processes really allow space for really deep and meaningful um, interaction and also discussion, but it, it also uses catalysts of um, journal writing and poetry and um, music and media and um, also like ritual and other art processes. Um, really to create space for young people to express their ideas in. Um, and I, I think that also it just, it, um, it, it allows young people not only to, you know, just express their ideas, but it, it creates tools and perspectives that help them kind of navigate through their changing worlds. So that's my elevator speech. <laughs> So, so can you tell us um, uh, why did you write this book and what do you hope uh, readers will get out of reading it? Yeah, um, I think one of the most striking things that I, I, just one of the truths that I've come across in 20 years of working with young people is young people's capacity and desire to go deep. Um, I think both as an educator and as a therapist, when I have really invited young people to just really like ah, dig in deep and really access their wisdom, whether it's about awareness around their own actions and behaviors or around making meaning out of some of their challenges or even just more esoteric themes, they almost always rise up to that challenge. And conversely, I, I feel like the culture kind of maybe out of laziness and perhaps because of fear, it, it imagines teenagers um, being and doing and being interested in certain things. And so it throws at them at Snapchat and the Kardashians, right? And so young people rise to that expectation. So I, I wanted to provide an alternative to a culture that was really focusing and valuing the external the superficial in some ways, um, and also that of accomplishment and rather valuing 
something that was more about self-reflection and about connection and about just the patient process of becoming. Um, I think I just felt like I wanted to create a, a, a space and a support for adults to provide young people with a way to connect to deep parts of themselves and also to this world because I, I just believe this life, um, this thing that we're in is just a really profound place and we have a very unique and profound role within it. And I think that young people need to grow up understanding that and really just connecting to that truth. So I created this, this, um, this book and this work. Great. Um, now, I know that this book is mostly geared towards adults who work with uh, young people, young young girls in particular. Um, do you think uh, 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 an, an adolescent would be able to read this book and get something out of it? Do you think their experience of the book will be a little bit different? Um, so if an adolescent were to just pick this up and read it, you're saying? Yeah. Um, the issue with this book is that it requires at least two people, I mean, to actually engage in it, right? So there are definitely pieces and narratives that I think um, there's inspirations in each of the activities. There's an intro that's really important. I think they can glean pieces from that, but this, this really is about <laughs> creating connection. Right. And so they can I imagine that they would look through it and just be like, I want to do this. Right. But I um, and that there's pieces of wisdom in them for them to take. But this is really about um, it, it's an active book. It's an engagement book. So it's it's not really about being taught something. It's really about evoking something and it's a process. And so in that way, it might be limited as far as a teenager is just picking it up other than the fact that I think that they would, if they saw the exercises, they would, they would want to probably participate in something like that. Hey, um, now I'm going to, I'm going to ask you about the writing process itself. You know, uh, this is your first book, of course. Um, um, and, uh, so, so what was more difficult? Was it more, more difficult to write the first sentence the last sentence or something in between? Um, you know, to just be honest, I, I feel like, I mean, all of the processes were about the same. And I, I have to say that I didn't really struggle too hard by writing, the, you know, in writing this book. I think part of the reason why is because this, this work is based off of 17 to 20 years of, you know, collecting this, this material, I've lived this work out, right? And so it was, it, it was just very readily available for me. I think the other piece is that I don't necessarily really consider myself a writer. Um, I, I think I, I see myself as an educator and a therapist, a writer, maybe third or fourth. And, and I think that allowed me to kind of let go of any perfectionism. Um, and and really just open and that perfectionism also I, I think often like sabotages a lot of writers right like they're really focusing on their their you know the pros that are coming out of them and i was just you know this work just needs to come out um and so i think it just availed me a little bit more to the creative flow um and just not getting stuck on anything um so I um I, I didn't you know I didn't it wasn't too hard there were little pieces you know that were a little difficult um, more than others but I think just overall this was just a really just I don't know just open easy process for me. Wow, you I think you're you're probably the only author on the planet uh, <laughs> that feels that way. I'm not a writer. Yeah. Okay, so then can you tell us a little bit about your writing process then? Um, I mean, this is, this is sort of a culmination of 17 years of working with 
um, adolescence, as you said. Um, so can you tell us um, about what the process of writing down your work was about, uh, was like? Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I did the intro last um, and I really did you know, at least 50% of this book is instruction. So I, I need to say that that was also, I got kind of a way easy because I think a lot of people write, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, you know, the, the whole book is their, their narrative voice. Um, and this was at least 50% instruction. So really I was writing instructions first so that I really had a sense of the work. I mean, I, like I said, I've lived out this work, but once I put it on paper, I really, I feel like I, I could embody it more in words. Um, and so the intro and the conclusion kind of came last. Um, and, um, and I also, I, I think one of the things I did is that I didn't really go and look at too many, anything that was kind of similar to what I was doing. I didn't look at it. And that was important for me because I just didn't want to go through comparisons and, oh, I don't have this piece. Like I just wanted to come out what organically came out. So afterwards I found, of course, like all this research and all this beautiful, um, really eloquent work on the subject. And I, I, you know, and there's times where I wish I could have incorporated into the book, but I also feel like this was just, I, I can feel really confident that this was all organically me um, for, the, for the most part. There's little pieces that I reference, but, so that was also an important part, just to make this an authentic voice and not like really just comparing or taking from other sources. Great. Um, so then, well, let's let's talk a little bit more about that then. Um, so what, from, from your perspective as an author and as someone who's worked with teens, um, you know, for pretty much all of your professional life, um, what, what is the sort of unique thing um, that you have to offer about um, working with girls? What would you say is the cornerstone thing? Um, well, I, I, two things are like popping into my mind. Um, one of the things is that I feel like the depth of my work is pretty unique. Um, and I'm not saying I'm the only one out there, but there is a way that I have had training grounds that were um, pretty rigorous. I mean, I, I started at a, uh, you know, a, a housing project in, in San Francisco. I worked at Juvenile Hall and like in the girls unit, I worked in the Oakland Public Schools. So I'm working with a, a population that's highly emotionally intelligent. Um, and you can't throw them dog and pony shows, right? Like you just, you really had to give them substance or they were just kind of, you know, like laugh you off um, or, you know, just not really listen. And so I, I think because of that training ground, um, what I'm providing has a depth that I don't, I think it's unique. Um, and the other piece is that I feel like I'm offering a, a, a more spiritual lens. I think that there's a lot of social emotional education out there um, and some of it's really, really good. Um, but I've noticed that a lot of it kind of steers away from the issue or the theme of spirituality. Um, and I think that it's time that we need to um, incorporate that in. And I understand that mindfulness is being, you know, starting to have much more tread in social emotional learning. Um, and I think we can go even beyond that as well. And so I think that this, this book and, and the work itself is unique in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, this, this question of spirituality. I mean, I, I think these days, um, you know, if you're at all familiar with what's going on um, in education, yeah, everyone's talking about social emotional learning, SEL, and they're talking about mindfulness in some circles, um, and um, you know, uh, getting getting students ready to learn, right? Um, um, but what's interesting about your book is that, yeah, you you do talk about spirituality and um, and uh, adolescence, right? And, and the, the spiritual lives of young, young girls. Um, can you tell us more about, 
why you think it's important for us to start talking about this. Sure. So um, I can lay out some statistics for you um, that's just based on numerous studies. And I mean, the, really out of the last 10 years, a lot, a lot of research has gone around adolescence um, and spirituality. And in particular, Lisa Miller, and she's the author of Spiritual Child and also a professor at Columbia University. She did a longitudinal study, 15 years really studying this theme. Um, and what came out of the research, and this has also been peer reviewed. So over and over again, her peers in the scientific community have you know, gone over this research and all the conclusions are the same. And, and basically what she found is that um, young people with this personal spirituality were 80% less likely to experience ongoing depression. And that's specifically um, important, I, I think, for girls because girls are three times more likely to experience depression than their male counterparts, right? So 80% less likely. <laughs> to experience ongoing depression, but it doesn't kind of stop there. there there's more research around that they're 70% less likely to engage in unprotected sex, and they're 50% less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. So spirituality then is, is one of the most, if not the most protective factor in the trifecta of kind of adolescent dangers. And in fact, what they found out, and this was really stunning to me, was that spirituality was four times more protective than edu education or social class, which is remarkable because we're spending so much time getting our kids just great education and getting great education so that they can make money and you know be happy and whole, when in fact, what actually makes them happy and whole is some level of, you know, a spiritual, pers a spiritual, um, a personal spirituality, right? So uh, there's other studies that surround her that say that with, again, with, with spirituality, young people have increased self-esteem, they have increased sense of purpose, they have uh, an increased sense of compassion and empathy, and also um, just an easier um, adjustment into adult life, right? So, um, I, I, I mean, I think that it's just, it's clear now through the research, you know, that, that spirituality is important. You can see why it's important specifically for girls, um, and I, I think you know, we might want to talk about what spirituality really entails, um, but it, it's it, it's a, a well-known research fact now that it is it, it's there's a need for it to be incorporated into the development of our youth. Yeah, um, yeah, I think I think uh, we're we're moving into a very interesting part of the conversation. That um, you know, um, one of our um, audience member Sonia asks, um, how does religion then come into play? Because um, you're using the word spirituality, and so maybe maybe you could parse religion and spirituality out. Woo, okay, so I, I'm <laughs> not going to pretend like I'm the expert. I hold the definition, right, um, with between spirituality and religion. But I, I, I do think that spirituality, um, that there is um, a separation in the sense, or maybe not a separation, but a distinction, um, that spirituality doesn't have to follow a, a particular a strict adherence to a religion or a creed. And also there is this, this deep sense of personal choice around it and a felt connection, right? Um, and and again because we're defining something that is describing a relationship with something that's a little like i don't know um supernal and and infinite um it, it's hard really to define but i i think in my book um just for context sake i think i say that spirituality is um what did i say it is the it is the awareness and the, the search 
for a connection with something greater than ourselves, um, to something transcendent. And for some people that might be um, a principle of love or of community. Um, I think maybe for someone else, it's it, it might be just the, the spirit inherent in nature. Um, for other folks, it might just be some kind of cosmic intelligence. Um, and then for other people, it, it is much more specific. Um, it, you know, it, it could be God, Allah, Olodumare, it could, I mean, you know, all of the names. So you, you can see that spirituality and religion, they, there's a crossover, right? But that there is, a, I think, a little bit, um, there's a little bit more of an openness around the, the term spirituality than, say, religion. Yeah, and, and you can you can even see that in the book itself. Um, all of the forty plus exercises and activities in your book, um, they they don't um, refer at all to any particular notion of God or the divine or or religious practice or ritual and, and things like that. Right? It's 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 as you just just said. Um, it's about finding meaning um, beyond beyond the self. Right? And, right. Absolutely. Um, and I, and as you point out in the book, um, uh, adolescence for for girls in particular, um, this is a, a sort of a ripe time to to do that exploration, and an important time to do that exploration, um, um, both in terms of uh, that, that sort of outcomes that um, you just cited in, your, in the research that's been done on this, but also um, in the overall sort of life course of a of a you know, young human being, um, it's an impo it's important that they ask these questions and, and figure it out a little bit or, or get started on that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, um, oh, go ahead. Oh. oh no, go ahead. Go. You're you're the author here. <laughs> Again, there's just I mean, all these books on the teenage brain that are coming out, and um, it really adolescence is more than any life stage in some ways is it's the most receptive to just spiritual engagement. I mean, there's, there's an actual need for it. Um, and without getting too technical, right? Like that, um, that it is a part of their developmental objective, right? To find their identity, right? But also to understand the world in this more um, expansive way. And like I said, if we just, throw at them kind of the, the superficiality and just that of accomplishment, that's that's what they understand the world to be. But if there's another context, a much larger context, the, the, the teenage brain takes that in as a framework for their understanding for the rest of their lives. Um, so it's, it's really important. It's so significant to their health and wellness and just their understanding of what this world is and who they are in it that we give them a bigger picture of, you know, what this world is and what their role in it is. Great. Um, did, did your childhood at all influence um, how you came up with these practices and maybe even how you wrote the book? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I definitely feel like um, I just had a really special, um, and maybe it's not special, I just thought it was special connection um, to the world when I was younger. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the things I wrote about in the book at one point was that, you know, we lived like three blocks away from the beach and I just... I sp and I was an only child, I spent a lot of my time at the beach. And I think early on, you know, when I was, if I was going through something or I was just, you know, trying to work something out of my head, I would go to the beach. And I, I remember almost understanding that the, the, the ocean was helping me out. <laughs> um, and it was more of a felt sense than actually a rational thing, um, but just that I had to go to the ocean. Right. Um, and I felt better after going to the ocean. Um, so I had this spiritual kind of sense really early on. I also my mom was very much a seeker. Um, and so she would just drag me along. I was like six, seven, eight years old to 
to different ashrams. Um, and I mean, just ever, we were all over the place. We, <laughs> Science of Religious Mind and Guru Maya and Self-Realization Center. I mean, we were just all over. So I, and I had really profound experiences in all of them and just connected to something deep there. And I, I know that it was so it was so enriching for me and protective for me. So I I just grew up with with that sense. Um, so I always thought that this was it was an important part of my childhood and adolescence. Um, and then also what happened to me that 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 was just the, the kind of more of the spiritual sense. But when I was in high school, I enrolled myself in a peer counseling class, and we didn't actually at the end of the day, learn how to do peer counseling, but it was an ex really exploratory class. And we just went through all these themes. And for the most part, we just talked. Um, but I have to say it was one of the only things that I really like took a hold of in high school. And I really feel like it was, it, it saved me in many ways. Um, and so I think the combination, the confluence of that experience, just with my own sense of um, the need for just a spiritual life as a young person, that is also very much what influenced this work and, and of course, then this book. Great. Um, I'm, I'm, all, I, I'm almost afraid to ask this question because I don't, I don't know <laughs> where it would lead, but um, this, there are these like interesting um, charms on the cover of your book, um, and I remember when we were creating the cover, um, you had mentioned that there is some importance uh, that you attach to the horseshoe. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Jason, um, can you go down this road? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't need to get too specific, but. Um, yeah, is, can you tell us what, what importance it has for you? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, I don't really know how to say this in a, in a kind of in a, in a shorter version, but when I was about 20 something, um, I think I was like 23 or 24, I had a dream that I, it was one of those dreams. I don't know if anybody else has felt this before. It was not a dream. It was, like, I just, I was transported somewhere, but it was as, as clear as this waking reality, probably even more clear. And um, it was the most profound dream I had, I have ever had. Um, and I really feel like in some ways it was a, a blueprint for my life. I am seeing actually now in the last year or two, how the resolution of that dream is really kind of coming into fruition now. Um, but there was a, ah, there was, um, a, a figure, I can't even, it didn't even necessarily have a gender, but it was a, a, a figure in my dream that was a deep kind of, um, a spirit that kind of led me and also led many other people through this deep, deep initiatory process. Um, and one of the things that it held, um, I mean, how I even came upon it was it was like, um, they were like kind of doing this horseshoe thing. They had an old horse and there was like pounding a horseshoe and we began talking and ended up on this whole journey thing. Um, and it's, it's a long story, but I was to remember this figure through the horseshoe. Um, and so I just see it partly as a guardian for me um, in some ways, or I, I'm not quite sure how to fit it, but um, it, it was a really, it was a deep dream. And, and when I, the moment I, the dream ended, I woke up and I bursted into tears and I've never forgotten it. And um, it's just had so much symbolic value for me in my life. And so, that's the horse too. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I wish I had dreams like yours. <laughs> um, Urena, can I can I read you one of my favorite uh, passages in your book? Sure, I love it. 
All right, so this comes from in the middle of the book on page 82. It's just an excerpt. So these two uh, young uh, women, Angie and Tatiana, have an argument. And I'm going to read um, a little bit about how that argument was resolved. After the two girls reluctantly agreed to the ground rules, the mediator asked Angie to begin by telling her her side of the story. Angie began in a hostile tone. I was just sitting there and Tatiana comes into the classroom, mean mugging me for no reason, and then slams her backpack down right near her, nearby my desk and doesn't say a word. I asked her what was up with her and she turned around and said, none of your blank business. I'm not going to let anyone talk to me like that. So I said something to her and we got up to fight. The mediator took a deep breath and employed active listening. So what I hear you saying is that you believe that Tatiana was mad at you by the look she gave you when she entered the class and slammed her books down. Yep, Angie responded assuredly. The mediator continued carefully, so you checked in with Tatiana to see what was wrong, but she still was shutting you down, and then you felt she disrespected you. You didn't do anything to hurt her, but you didn't do anything to her that you knew of, so you felt like you didn't deserve that, and you needed to let her know she couldn't talk to her like that. Yep, Angie repeated. The mediator turned to Tatiana so she could tell her side of the story. Tatiana began in an equally defensive tone. I came into the room, sat down, and Angie was like, What the blank is wrong with you? I couldn't deal with anyone's crap today, and so I went off on her. The mediator reflected back. So from your point of view, you had just entered the room, not mad at Angie or meaning to snap at her. So you were surprised when she asked you, in the way she did, what was happening with you. Tatiana interrupted the mediator, irritated. Yeah, I just couldn't deal with anyone's BS today. The mediator, skillfully listening, picked up on something, and asked Tatiana a question that changed everything. I heard you say something about today. I couldn't deal with anyone's crap today. What is it about this day that is so different, that makes it hard to deal with anyone or anything? There was a long, drawn-out silence, and in the midst of it, Tatiana sat in her chair, almost shaking, struggling to keep her stone wall erected. We all sat there patiently, holding space for what might emerge out of her. I then gently said, we're here for you. Tatiana's tears began to flow down her face. Her pain was so tangible and tender, I believe everyone in that room could feel it. In the course of the session, Tatiana told us that one year ago, to the day, her brother had been killed in a drive-by shooting. Through her tears, she talked about how close she was to him, how much she missed him, and how angry she was that she didn't get to live this life with him in it. When the session finally concluded, the two girls did not make any agreements, shake hands, or make any formal apologies to one another. They didn't have to. There was something far more powerful communicated between the two disputants, a shared, unspoken understanding that life hurts and that vulnerability and empathy is medicine for that kind of pain. Uh, really, yeah, I, I really loved this passage. Um, and in, in the context of um, teaching uh, adolescents um, empathetic attunement, right? Uh, and and also having the courage to be vulnerable, you know, and to give them the tools um, to deal with the pain, the the ugly side of life, right? Uh, it's just such a um, great um, 
passage in this in the book, and I, I really, really was touched by it a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now I shared already my favorite part of the book. So, um, can you tell us maybe uh, what's what's your favorite exercise um, from the book? Because there are, there are more than forty of them. Yeah. Um, I was hoping you weren't going to ask this question, um, <laughs> because I, I, I don't, I really, I don't know if I have a favorite exercise. Um, I think, and that's part of why I love this book. Um, I think, you know, sometimes you might read something and, you know, different curriculums and find just three or four really great gems. Um, and I feel like this book is filled with gems and there might be three that are like, oh, that's nice, right? But like a lot of them are um, just create just such depth um, and connectivity that I, I really, really can't think of one specifically that um, that is always just this all time favorite. Um, but I will say that there are certain exercises, of course, that like drop the young people in on this really deep level. Um, and I have to say that I, I really just feel like the last chapter, um, the, the sacred living space or the, the sacred living um, chapter and all of the activities that are involved in that, I think that there's something so unique about them and so special and bring forward such, I mean, there's beautiful, beautiful things in young people um, that I, I would say that my favorite chapter is the sacred living. Great. Um, so we have another question from the audience, uh, from Sonia again. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Um, hey, Sonia. How, can, <laughs> how can parents support the child's decision to be quote unquote, be spiritual? Um, so it's interesting. I, I'm going to promote Lisa Miller's book again um, because she she definitely has a whole like drawn out I, ideas around this. Um, I think also my book has these little um, they're called parent paths um, in sacred living. They're they're throughout the book, but in sacred living of things that are kind of like these really just subtle um, activities and openings that parents can do um, that that begins the discussion, right? So this is really important. This part of the research and the protective factor that spirituality has, it, it really has to come from um, young people, that they have to have a personal relationship. And it and they find that the research starts to dwindle when when children take on their parents' ideas um, and, and spirituality that it's not as protective, it's not as powerful. And so it's around finding, um, finding opening up discussions. I mean, for my mom, she did a little bit more directly, but just exposing me to different ideas um, and, and not just cornering it towards one particular, one in particular. Um, it's really having them really connect to nature, but, and, and sometimes it's not just walking through nature. It's really just like opening up dialogue and having them, you know, engage in, in nature in this really like a, a a deeper way. And again, I have exercises around that. Um, and it's just when the subject of spirituality comes up to not be afraid of it, right? Just to, to go there and, and, and leave it open. I think a lot of times adults kind of shy away from it because they don't really know. And they don't, <laughs> they don't want to say sometimes to their children or, you know, to their students, like, I don't know. You know, and, and so these are some of the ideas that are out there. Um, but just to be able to be vulnerability in your own not knowing, but but allowing discussions and, a, and, and asking them, like, what do you think, you know, or what, you know, just this kind of they're they're kind of experts on it, too, or they're they're just 
their ideas and their imagination are just as, as relevant as, as adults. So um, there are very particular things, like I said, in the book that you can do to kind of initiate those discussions or the, that kind of exploration. Um, but I think that there are times within the day that I just, I, all my experiences as, as an educator or therapist, like the issue of like these larger existential questions and the idea of God, it comes up all the time without solicitation, you know? So I, I think just to be able to be fluid and open to those com conversations and, and be, be open to not knowing yourself. Great. Um, <clears throat> again, if you're in the audience, you can feel free to type in your questions or comments in the chat um, or in the question and answer uh, panel in the top right. Um, so, um, Irina, I'm, I'm curious uh, what you think about this. Um, so, so what what roles do you think um, male figures have um, when it comes to um, the question of nurturing um, a confident and more wholehearted adolescent? Uh, male figures, whether they are a parent, uh, a parent or um, a teacher or uh, a working professional uh, who's working with um, adolescent girls. Um, uh, do, do you have any um, perspective or ideas about this? Um, so, I mean, I, a lot of different things. I think male figures, particularly, and I think that they then embody father, father-like figures, right? Um, in some psychologies, they're really, um, they become instrumental around and are connecting to, um, for females and, and for young girls in particular, just um, the ego self and the drive. Um, and, and they talk about sometimes, and I, again, this is such a generality and I've seen so <laughs> many variations and, and, um, and, and in instances where this is contradicted, but that a male figure is important um, in in one portion of a female's. It's it, it's called the like kind of the anima of like just the sense of wholeness, uh, her her kind of her outer directedness, her drive, right? So that that um, that relationship is is important for its specific you know purposes. Um, and um, I think that as far as facilitating this stuff, I, I think there is something about um, having a female facilitator, um, maybe facilitating this process is important as far as safety because there, um, there, there just is a, there's a reality of misogyny and, um, patriarchy and I think that females not always but often feel safer within spaces of um, you know other females however I I absolutely believe that um, like say male figures could also be prominent in this work I think what is really important is just a really deep sense of intuition and connection and um, just transparency in this work. And so um, I, I just, I think, I, I think that male figures absolutely can and should play a role in the development of young girls. Um, and I, I also wanna say conversely um, that I think that this work is important for males as well. I mean, I, I have to be honest that a lot of this that was developed, um, this work that was developed in this book and my work was done with both self-identified females and males, right? Like this was gender inclusive. And for particular reasons, this, this book got centered um, towards girls. But, but the reality is that this book can be used with all adolescents. Um, there are only maybe three or four exercises that are very girl-centered, and the rest is just very, very inclusive. Um, so 
I believe that males, um, <laughs> young boys need this work just as much, if not more, than girls. Um, so I, I think it's also a really important piece that we add. I mean, I, I get it, it's girls rising and there is a need for it to be girl centered, but the reality is that it, it is also inclusive with self-identified males as well. Yeah, and of course, there's always another book um, that we can do. <laughs> I, I actually, I am, I have already gotten more actually requests to do younger versions. So, like with doing it either with children, with elementary school um, children, this kind of kind of social emotional, but the spiritual con component with with children, right? Um, so I'm I'm thinking about that right now, formulating it. That's that's really interesting. Do, do you think um, it will be easier or, or harder or just about the same? Uh, I think it will be with younger children. A little harder. So part of my work for the last maybe four years is that I entered in the elementary school systems in in Oakland, um, and I was. Um, I'm, you know, doing mental health therapist in the schools, and I started developing um, social emotional curriculum um, for the classroom as well, um, and developed some, some, you know, some really, I think, some solid curriculum. But there is this issue when you're when you're incorporating spirituality, I think with elementary school students, because they don't really have that, um, th that abstract thinking that adolescents have access to, right? You, there's a limitation to where you go, right? So it's a lot around mindfulness um, and just exploring just on a very, very basic level. So I don't think that um, it might go as deep as the adolescents would, um, but, I think that there are absolutely ways and vehicles for beginning to introduce this idea of spirituality with young people. Yeah, um, so sort of jumping back a little bit, uh, can, can you tell us about um, the work you do uh, in the Oakland uh, public school system? Sure. So. Um, I was hired in about 2001 at a Oakland high school to develop and run a conflict mediation program. And I, I did that. I um, got a group of peer mediators and trained them and it was very successful. Um, but what I was seeing kind of right away was, was two things. One was that this was an intervention and in some ways a recovery um, model. But there was nothing being done on a preventative basis, you know, to really just deal with conflict. Um, and, and the larger piece was that this school was, um, like many schools, just filled with trauma. And of course, conflict was kind of the vehicle of that trauma and just feeling like we just had to do more work um, socially, emotionally um, within the classroom. And so what happened was that there was an existing program, it was called Triumph, um, trying to uplift my folks. And uh, the founder of that, Derek Smith, he was really doing a lot of work around um, radical social theory and having breaking down the components of oppression and masculinity and homophobia, all, just all of these different things so that high school could understand and they could also understand the context that they were in. And so he was doing incredible work around that, but he also, he wanted a social emotional piece, the conflict mediation piece. So we kind of joined forces and I, I kind of, I integrated into Triumph. And so we started co-running it basically. And it was at first an after school program and then it got so popular that it, they changed it into an elective class. And so we had hundreds of students coming in through us. And so they were learning radical social theory. And then I would add in this piece of social kind of emotional education. And it was um, I, like nothing. It was most amazing experience, both for us and also for the youth that came through it. I, I mean, I still have 
young people who are adults now that come to me to this day that are, I mean, they just say how much it changed their life, how much they still incorporate some of the ideas and um, tools that we gave them. Um, and also within that, the last about two or three years, we had really created a lot of trust in the community with the parents and the students and also the school community. And I started getting a little bit more, um, I guess a little bit more radical. And, and what was happening is that the, the young people over and over, and this happens everywhere I go, is that they, they start asking all these larger existential questions. And so we, we start talking about them, but then I'm like, oh, this is off point, right? And like, I kind of veer them into the theme that we're talking about. And I just was like, why am I doing that? I, I understand how important and crucial that was, this was to my development, you know? And so I think the last couple of years, I really started um, introducing way, way more spiritual concepts, meditation and mindfulness, but also, I mean, we like for example i brought in a panel of spiritual elders and for two hours there was like 150 kids the, the or students the, the students were just asking these elders from different traditions all these questions and there was this dialogue going back and forth and I, the, the elders left like who are these kids you know it was just such a re rich dialogue and then i think for like dios de los muertos there um we held this this event where like at the, the front of the school, we created this incredibly, just this beautiful altar with flowers and candles and offerings. And this, these Azteca dancers came and blessed the grounds. And then a Yoruba priest came in and blessed the grounds. This is a public high school, right? And hundreds of people there, but there was just, because it was so inclusive and there was so much trust there, it was this was allowed to kind of take place and the students also just came up and gave offerings to their ancestors and also there had been a lot of students who had um had died through homicide that year and just so just really giving them a space to just you know to to acknowledge that you know and in some ways just to like let let be held by the community around that. It was such a moving event. So I really understood then the power of incorporating this, these more spiritual kind of ideas and um, and just just yeah, just these experiences. Um, and so that just that kind of led again into the elementary school work and and now this book. Yeah, wonderful. Um, now, you know, you know, what, one of the things that I found really interesting about the book is that although it's um, it's geared towards um, helping adults who um, are around or work with um, adolescent girls um, to um, to to nurture them and to to help the, uh, these girls. Um, um, find meaning in their lives and to, to become confident and to uh, develop resilience and, and all those, all those good things. Right. But I, I have a feeling also that the book, the practices in the book um, can really benefit the adults. Um, and so ha have you ever, have you experienced that yourself or have seen it in the facilitators that you've trained? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I, I think that one of the things I encourage is for the adult facilitators to do these processes either with the students or before the students. Um, and partly because, you know, you, I, I think that it's, it's, it's right that adults do the work, you know, do that deep internal work and even spiritual work before or while they're presenting it to young people. Um, and I think maybe there's some part of me that knows that if adults go through this process, if they hadn't gone through it before, um, to really engage themselves in these really deep ways and challenging in some ways, ways that it, it would also affect the facilitators as well, right? So that it, it just becomes this two way, um, two-way kind of dynamic 
where it's not the the facilitators, the adults giving, right? Like this this process to young people, but they themselves will be affected. Um, and I think that that is, that is the power also of, of this process is that both, both sides are will be affected. Um, so I, I think that that is a astute observation. I think um, I think that I meant to do that on some level because we all need to do this work. Um, and I, in some ways, I was fortunate enough to have a little piece of it when I was in high school. I've also offered it to young people, but most people don't really get to go through these deep processes, you know? Um, and we also forget, I just think in the day-to-day -day of our, our lives, just how profound this world is, you know? And just, and, and just to really um, connect to ourselves, we don't get a lot of opportunities to do this. So, I mean, yeah, I think that this is a great opportunity for facilitators to really be enriched and transformed by the process as well. Yeah, I, I think you even even uh, now that I think of it, I think you referenced this, you know, Eastern Eastern philosophical saying, um, you know, the teacher and the student both create the teaching. That's right. Um, and and yeah, um, I, I think teachers, adults, parents, uh, especially parents, I think, uh, um, can can benefit uh, just as much as um, the the the. the the girl or the, the adolescent um, being taught these different skills and practices. Um, well, we're coming up on time. Um, thank you everyone who joined us on this webinar uh, for um, you know, spending your lunch hour with us uh, if you're here out here on the West Coast. Um, um, and uh, yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation that we had and, and yeah, please, um, Pick up the book, uh, ask for it at your local library, uh, or order it through your independent bookstore and at booksellers everywhere. Urena, where, where can people find you? Uh, I have a website, uranajackson.com. It's U-R-A-N-A jackson.com. Um, so that's kind of the best way to get a hold of me and just also kind of shows all the services that I'm, I'm engaged in. And of course, there's a page for the, the book as well. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.